Good morning, everybody. Good morning on day four of SHA 2017. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Melanie Reback. She is the CEO and co-founder of Radically Open Security, the world's first non-profit computer security consulting company. And th not only was she named ICT Professional of the Year in 2010, but, and one of the most successful women in the, in the Netherlands, but also in 2016, she was one of the most inspiring women in tech. So we'll give her a warm welcome. Hello. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. So, all right. Uh, I'm here with, uh, with more stories. I, uh, last night, uh, gave a talk that was a bit more of a personal nature. Uh, today, I'm giving a talk, I think, that's a bit more of a, uh, of a technical nature. Uh, so the story that I'm going to tell today uh, is basically a job that we had performed uh, for one of our customers. I do have permission to say who the customer is. In this particular case, uh, we were working with SurfNet. I had actually invited them to come and join us for this talk. They unfortunately were not able to actually, you know, physically be here. Uh, but uh, in either case, I do have a special guest uh, who is going to join uh, very briefly at the end. But I'm, I'm going to tell a story about spear phishing, about uh, the technical side of it, about the tooling side of it, and a, a little bit surprisingly towards the end, a bit about the ethical and the philosophical side of it. Uh, from the perspective of a uh, security consultancy company. So we will start at the beginning. We were asked to conduct uh, their annual spear phishing test uh, for 2016. And uh, what the situation was, they wanted us to so-called spear fish the entire organization. Yeah, spear fish 150 people. Okay, that's not really spear phishing, but uh, you know, <laughs> nonetheless. And, and, and the definition of the uh, job that they wanted was they wanted a low and slow phishing attack. You know, low and slow on 150 people. You know, again, <laughs> but uh, you know, th these are lessons. You know, of course, us being incredibly bright-eyed and eager, we're like, yes, of course, we can do that. You know, and uh, <laughs> well, so the way that that uh, we started was uh, by registering a uh, domain. We wanted to come up with something fairly innocuous sounding. So we registered the domain clickanalytics.amsterdam. Uh, actually, the first uh, use for the .amsterdam domain I've ever had, but I uh, <laughs> love those new TLDs. But uh, why click analytics? Because everybody is used to click trackers. <laughs> you know, And if you basically uh, use something that sounds like a bit you know, analytics e, then you know people might not think that it's malicious. So that was uh, our reasoning behind uh, registering that particular domain. Uh, malware was out of scope. I mean, they basically said, "Look, if we click, we believe that you can own us." You know, but given that we want to, uh, you know, really just check uh, our entire staff uh, and we want to keep the budget within certain constraints, uh, we're just, we, we only want to look at, cl at tr uh, click tracking and uh, click percentages. So that, uh, again, these are just the, the rules of the game now, you know, <laughs> of the engagement. Um, and another thing that we basically then did is we set up a landing page that essentially just said insert malicious code here as a placeholder uh, because, of course, uh, you know, uh, you could very well just as easily insert your client-side uh, exploit here. But again, that was outside of the rules of engagement for this particular assignment. They just wanted to know, are people going to click or not? So... Um, Low and slow. So we figured, okay, how do you do a low and slow phishing attack? Well, why don't we just start with one test subject? So we took our point of contact, and we knew that he was incredibly into running. So we basically said, okay, well, you know, low and slow, spear phishing, targeted. Why don't we try and uh, take a, a running newsletter? Because we know he's super into running. So he's going to click on that, right? <laughs> So, uh, indeed, you know, uh, subscri we subscribed to some newsletters, you know, uh, keep on running, Pantanel, you know, we, you know, just to see if we could, uh, could um, use it. So, we took 
the uh, running newsletter. We basically manually uh, you know, scraped the thing, converted the URLs so that if you clicked on the URLs, it would uh, land on our uh, Click Analytics uh, tracking page. And you know, it basically took us a day to put together a fairly good-looking pretext you know, that was actually targeted uh, to this particular guy. So, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, we sent off the email. And we waited. And we waited. <laughs> hmm. He didn't click. <laughs> and then we kind of figured out, hmm, this might be harder than we thought. <laughs> Especially if they want us to fish 150 people. <laughs> So, all right, <laughs> mm, yeah, what's plan B? <laughs> so, um, yeah, if we think that we're going to have any hope at all of being able to actually target a larger group of people, it's becoming evident to us that automation might be needed here. <laughs> but, of course, then we start, uh, you know, re redefining the engagement somewhat because at that point, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes a little bit less spear phishing and a little bit more generic phishing. <laughs> I mean, we're still trying to target it, but, you know, again, it, tr trying to target this mass group of people, you know. And, uh, yeah. So we came up with a new idea. And our idea was, well, what about spam? You know, everybody receives it. Sometimes people click on it, depending on what the spam is. And nobody's going to think it's suspicious. You know, because by definition, spam is unwanted. And spam is annoying. And if people are annoyed by it, then they're not going to be suspicious. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we figured, you know, we could try, you know. <laughs> this is an experiment. So, uh, yeah, a another thing, though, also about spam is we receive a whole bunch of it. So basically what we can do is we can just, like, take the spam that we receive, and then we can just write scripts to automatically instrument it, you know, so that when you click on it, it goes to our landing page, you know, with the insert malware here, uh, placeholder. And uh, voila, you know, at that point, if we just collect enough sort of relevant pieces of spam, then we can probably get a good part of the organization. You know, so that was uh, that was sort of our uh, our thinking. So, so that leads then to the question of how much do you actually want to target it? You know, spear phishing by definition is fairly hard, highly targeted, but the question is, you know, what are the pros and cons of targeting? You know, the thing about spam is spam is actually not always highly targeted. Sometimes spam is actually pretty generic, but people click on it anyways. And the thing is that if you do target somebody, if they notice that something's wrong, they're going to get suspicious much faster. Whereas if you target somebody less, and instead you just send something a bit more spammy, you know, if they notice there's something wrong with it, well, I mean, there's, you know, spelling mistakes in half the spam emails that we get anyways, <laughs> you know, or if something's not entirely correct. So the truth of the matter is, is that targeting is, more targeting is not actually always better. <laughs> you know, but again, these were some of the uh, things, you know, that we were experimenting with uh, and learning during this job. So the question then became really, you know, to what extent should we be targeting individual staff members versus just trying to come up with more blanket generic pretexts, you know, so we can sort of stay under the radar and just sort of hope that people are going to be kind of stupid and click anyways. <laughs> you know, so these are some of the questions uh, that uh, we wanted to ask. So uh, we took a pretext. I apologize, the image quality isn't great. But we took basically one of those uh, book bundles. I have to say, we, we love book bundles. In fact, I think I just uh, re recently purchased this hacking book bundle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, you know, a lot of us like this kind of stuff. So we took uh, one of these, so this uh, story bundle, and we basically uh, took it, scraped it, instrumented it, and then sent it off to a group of people. What uh, wound up happening was people clicked. <laughs> you know, it was fairly generic. It was kind of spammy. It wasn't really that targeted, but people liked it. 
Another thing that we did, and this is kind of evil, but uh, I decided to do it anyways, is, you know, we were dealing again with SurfNet, and they're very much in the internet community. So uh, at one point, I decided we were going to take the uh, invitation letter for the uh, ISOC.NL uh, New Year's Borel, <laughs> so, and then basically take that, instrument it, <laughs> send it. I, I told Miffy Lanars that I was doing it, and he kind of rolled his eyes at me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so uh, we did. And surprisingly, actually fewer people clicked. <laughs> And you would think, why, right? Because, you know, a lot of the people at SURF are actually going to this thing, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is actually something that's more relevant to the community. But actually, more people clicked on the pretext related to the book bundle. Why? Be I don't know. J you know, just because something actually is somewhat highly targeted to the area that people are working in actually doesn't always mean they're going to click more often. Which, again, I think, to me, at least started to challenge some of my assumptions about phishing and targeting, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so this was interesting. So what wound up uh, happening is, uh, and, and right now I'm basically going to, I decided to use screenshots uh, today because I don't feel like opening my email on a live stream, but, uh, <laughs> you know, only hackers are watching what could happen. But, uh, oh, sorry, the image quality is so horrible. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, th this uh, is a screenshot from uh, Rocket Chat, which basically is our... Um, uh, our working environment within radically open security. And what we did, and I'm sorry this is barely readable, but basically the first thing that I did here is I, I executed a command using our chatbot that basically said raw spot uh, shell command create pretext SHA-2017 volunteers. And what I did is I actually put in the URL uh, HTTPS SHA-2017.org slash, uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, here, let me actually read it from my screen, sorry. Uh, yeah, slash uh, call for volunteers. Uh, and then after that, I put the, the sender email address, which basically is no reply at sha2017.org. So essentially what I did uh, this morning is I basically just scraped uh, the most latest uh, blog article from the SHA website. <laughs> and I basically said, I want to take this website, I want to scrape it, and then I want to turn it into a phishing mail with this pretext name, so that's SHA-2017 uh, volunteers, I'm sorry, this isn't really readable, um, but the SHA-2017 volunteers is the name of the pretext. And then what we do is we decouple the actual stored pretext, so the creation of the pretext, from actually sending it. So we can actually create a database of targets using uh, a list of group names. And then uh, we can then send uh, different uh, sort of pretexts uh, to different groups at different times. So that's the way that we set up this uh, spear phishing uh, toolkit. So, I'm s uh, sorry, this isn't readable. Uh, so basically, uh, what wound up happening then is, uh, yeah, if you could read this, it basically says Rossbot getting pretext. So the first thing that it's, do is it's doing is it's actually uh, basically picking up the page. So you can see sort of here this call for volunteers right around here. So it's actually right now uh, uh, downloading the web page. At that point, uh, then what it is doing is uh, I call another command. So you can see this command right here, this Rossbot shell command uh, spearfish send. So at this point, uh, we, we, we can either send to groups or send to individuals. I wanted to send to myself. So I said spearfish send SHA-2017 volunteers. Melanie at radicallyopensecurity.com. So in this case, I only wanted to send it to myself, so uh, I did. So the next thing that happens, and again, sorry, this is not very readable on the big screen, but it then says uh, Melanie at radicallyopensecurity.com has hash number and then the hash ID with email Melanie at radicallyopensecurity.com. And then the next thing that you see is it says, I received a click in a phishing email by Melanie at radicallyopensecurity.com. I received an image view in a phishing mail uh, using the pretext SHA-2017 volunteers. And then you can see right here at the bottom, it actually registered a, uh, a second click. So I re again, I received a click in a phishing mail by radically, Melanie at radicallyopensecurity.com. So the way that it actually works and how I, I did it with, uh, with SurfNet and also how I've done it with other customers is we actually let, again, the customers into the chat room. And the fun part is they can actually watch 
while the people in their own organization are clicking. <laughs> and they can actually see it coming in in real time, <laughs> which is really a lot of fun. You know, and they can actually see who did the clicking because in the URL, I mean, essentially all we're doing in the URL is just uh, hashing essentially the, the pretext name, uh, the sender email address, <laughs> you know, and then based on this hash ID that, you know, it's, it's stored in our, in, in our database. So we can then, of course, look up uh, which pretext was it, which email address was it, and then it renders that uh, in real time, more or less, in the... Uh, you know, in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the chat room. So that's essentially how the uh, spear phishing suite works. So uh, the actual email itself, this is a little bit easier to read, but what you can see now is this is the, the blog post that I was t talking about from the Shaw website. So that uh, script that we wrote, basically all it did was scrape it turn it into an email, and you can basically see that I, I was viewing this, I think, in, in Thunderbird. <laughs> you know, and uh, the sender email address should be what we specified, which is basically, and we always use no reply at and then choose your domain name, because that way if people try to respond to it, they're not going to get anything. And uh, yeah, and for the rest, uh, all of the links, uh, if you click on them, what's going to happen is first, it's going to go to our landing page. So in this case, uh, click analytics.amsterdam. Of course, in the future, I'm not going to be using that one anymore because I'm telling you guys what it is, but uh, <laughs> but you guys get the idea. So so yeah, so first it, it goes to uh, click analytics.amsterdam. And then the next thing uh, that it does is it redirects to the actual content. So p at that point, people actually are on the page where they expect to be. So um, another thing that was made things a little bit more complicated is this actually only works really for HTML uh, mails because uh, if people are using uh, text-based email clients or if people are using uh, certain mail clients where HTML is turned off, uh, sometimes by default, uh, then you actually can see the redirect uh, through uh, Click Analytics. You know, it's a design decision whether or not we want to be able to operate with uh, non-HTML mails. In our case, what we did is we actually just put in a warning that uh, if somebody o opened it in a non-HTML compliant email reader, we basically just said, we're sorry, you know, this email cannot be displayed, you know, <laughs> uh, because there's HTML, uh, use another email client. So we did that to basically prevent people, you know, f with non-HTML browsers from being able to see our landing page just in, ca in case click analytics.amsterdam might make anybody uh, suspicious. So, all right. Um, so, you know, with this toolkit, it basically gave us a number of knobs that we could turn in this experiment. So it gave us, uh, you know, the targeted versus non-targeted knob that we could adjust. Other things that uh, we could adjust, for example, were batch sizes. You know, answering questions like, is it better to fish more people at once? you know, but then, you know, risk that they're going to talk with each other. But at the same time, of course, fishing more people at once is also more efficient. And remember, we're trying to do this within a budget, you know, which is limited. <laughs> so, you know, we can't spend unlimited amounts of time on this either. But of course, that's exactly the same plight that a real attacker is going to have as well. You have to try and make trade-offs about how effectively you can actually fish somebody versus the amount of time and effort that you want to spend on it. So, um, all right. So, surprise, surprise the number one most clicked pretext was a fake LinkedIn invitation. <laughs> Again, we're talking about highly technical people. You know, and, and to me, it was actually really surprising that when we sent a whole bunch of really targeted pretexts, and then we sent a whole bunch of really generic pretexts, what did people click on? The generic stuff even though they were highly technical, highly IT savvy, actually reasonably security savvy people. And that to me was really a surprise. So yeah, uh, so that was certainly one of the, uh, one of the lessons uh, that we learned. I mean, you know, perhaps also some of you guys can, uh, <laughs> you know, it starts to make you reevaluate <laughs> perhaps how in your own phishing awareness sessions maybe you're going to present some of this stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, but, but the truth is non -tech, you know, even highly technical people click on this kind of stuff too. So a uh, detailed breakdown. Total target addresses, 145. In the end, uh, we did 14 uh, mailings. Um, 
the reason, again, this is why we needed the automation. If we had actually tried doing 14 independent pretexts by hand, it would have taken us forever. You know, so that's actually why in the end we sort of needed the scraping tools and being able to scrape it automatically from web websites because that allowed us to create those pretexts really quickly. Um, so we sent uh, 528 messages. 261 times uh, these messages were opened, and we were actually able to op uh, see if they were opened by uh, image views. So we also had instrumented the images in the HTML mails in the, in the same way that spammers you know, often do. Uh, so we could actually see, even if they didn't click on it, we were still able to see if they opened the mail uh, to look at it. Total clicks, uh, 46. Unique click IP addresses, 29. And the most clicked pretext was LinkedIn. Uh, with eight clicks. So the funny thing was, the biggest problem that we wound up having was the spam filter. <laughs> that's surprise. <laughs> yeah, but if you're trying to fish with spam, that's what happens. <laughs> so, you know, so what we wound up doing is, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we first started researching SPF values <laughs> to basically try and figure, how, figure out how we could evade the spam filter. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that was, uh, that that was interesting. Uh, and also, we found that uh, the optimum batch size of phishing spam, so basically using spam to fish, were batches large enough to hit as many targets as possible without getting marked by the spam filter. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so... Yeah, again, th th this went in sort of completely surprising directions, you know, while we were doing this job. But uh, it makes sense, I mean, when you think about it. So, you know, uh, at first we were being really, really cautious. And then as the deadline uh, towards the end of the phishing job uh, came up, we started getting more and more aggressive just because we wanted to know sort of how far can we push this before people start noticing. So we started, you know, getting a little bit ballsy. We started, you know, uh, doing things that were a little bit more reckless just because, well, look, if they, ca if they catch us, that's one of the end conditions of this phishing test. A at some point, actually, we kind of want them to catch us because we want to know how far we can push it, you know. <laughs> we, we, you know. So at a certain point, uh, what we did is, uh, you know, we started uh, increasing the batch sizes, you know, just to see what they notice. That didn't really attract too much attention. What did attract our attention the, ver the very first time, though, was uh, sending basically a fake Mozilla security update to the CSERT team. <laughs> You know, if we were really trying to be low and slow, we wouldn't have done that. But we basically just figured, yeah, let's see if they're paying attention. <laughs> so we did that, uh, and indeed, uh, <laughs> they noticed. So uh, we wound up getting six clicks uh, on the uh, fake Mozilla security update. We are presuming from a uh, sandboxed environment. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, the CSERT team. The other thing also is that we didn't really take much effort to try and um, hide our tracks. So if you did actually look at the Click Analytics domain, it was actually registered to radically open security. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, if I were a real attacker, real attacker, like a malicious one, I would have gone to more effort <laughs> to try and hide our identity. But the way that I figured it, you know, if they got suspicious, I actually want it to lead back to us quickly so they can understand that it's a phishing test. <laughs> and so we're not going to cause too much damage, hopefully, you know, <laughs> while they're trying to figure out uh, what actually happened. So... Uh, but then, you know, things uh, at one point sort of got a little bit out of control. So I guess first I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, tell my side of the story, and then I'm going to invite a special guest up on stage to, t to tell his side of the story. So uh, there's this new media organization called Setup uh, in Utrecht. And, uh, you know, they've got a lot of good connections with the surf organization. And there's a lot of people within surf that are on the board or that are, you know, members of setup or, or that like them. So we basically figured, well, let's take setup and let's use them as a pretext. Because, again, we were experimenting with targeting. We basically figured, you know, what harm is it going to do, right? I mean, it's basically just going to, uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to stay within the surf environment. And, uh, you know, it, it, setup probably won't even notice. And, you know, everything's going to be great. That's what we thought <laughs> until it escaped. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, probably now is, is the time. <laughs> I'm going to invite uh, Diamond on stage here to tell his side of the story. <laughs> yes. Oh, that, that was fun. Um, so we suddenly it started with the tweet that we got. And, um, and we just started thinking, like, what, what, it said that, hey, setup, stop spamming us. What's going on you know, with your systems? 
and we were felt immediately quite ashamed and and um i remember like i thought ah oh, i built the first version of our website and it used to have this mailing module in it in drupal and i thought oh maybe that's been abused so i started going to the website disabling stuff modules from way back when and hoping that would fix it and uh, while my colleague frank jan he's uh, our um, uh, um uh, communications guy and he was trying to you know communicate on twitter and, and make you know everybody feel okay um and that, that we spent basically an afternoon trying to to handle this and trying to understand what was going on um and uh that that, that we find out what the, really the cause was <laughs> and maybe i can go into a little bit about what what, what happened because in the end it was it was um really good for us because um, Surfnet um, got in touch with us and we got in touch with them. And in the end, they uh, became our sponsor for our yearly uh, privacy lecture that we do uh, in the Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we, that was a really good outcome for us where they, they said, you know, we'll uh, try to compensate for you. And now they're doing it again this year. So it became a, a running thing, which is nice. <laughs> so, so in the end, it was really good for us. But that day was really like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> yeah. So that's a bit my, uh, my story. Anything else? Uh, maybe for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that was kind of a stressful day for me too because i was on my way back uh, from a customer I, I just gotten off the train i was like just getting in the bus i got a phone call like melanie log, in, log into rocket chat now <laughs> i was just like oh crap what's going on so uh, <laughs> i basically log in it's sort of like panic they're like oh my god you know we've been caught and they're angry and oh my god like legal action and like oh my god I, I have to fix this so I, I you know I spent basically the first you know 24 hours like on the phone with everybody <laughs> like I was on the phone with the setup like profusely apologizing I was on the phone with with the surf organization because what wound up happening is people from surf literally started posting on twitter you know set up why are you spamming us <laughs> I was like crap so you know so so you know now I have to basically talk to people, everybody in the surf organization, you know, who didn't know about the phishing test and, and tell them immediately what's going on. So they'll basically take stuff off of Twitter, <laughs> you know, and at the same time, you know, you know, we're supposed to be the ethical security company here. Yeah. Oops. You know, <laughs> you know, sometimes we make some mistakes, too, you know, but uh, yeah. So, so the first day was really just just damage control. And, you know, once we got the damage control, I mean, as uh, as he said, I mean, in the end, you know, hopefully all's well that ends well, but we learned some lessons from it, <laughs> you know, and those lessons are things that I think that the whole, well, everybody can learn from and also for future engagements, we can actually carry forward to also try and prevent, you know, making those inc same incredibly stupid mistakes again. So, you know, so, so that actually leads then to, uh, you know, the question of ethical issues as a security company conducting spear phishing attacks. I had a never thought about this. You know, if you are a, a, a security company and you are using other third parties as a pretext, is that okay? You know, because basically what you're doing is you're stealing the identity of a third party who did not sign a waiver with you. And you're causing them some kind of reputational damage. You know, even if you think it's not going to escape the environment of your customer. In this case, I did not think it was going to escape the surf environment, but it did. You know, and that wound up causing some amount of damage. You know, thankfully, you know, in the end, it worked out. But, you know, but the thing was, I did not ask Setup in advance for their permission. Is that okay? I think actually, no, it's not okay. <laughs> but, you know, it never occurred to me because I, I just thought, oh, but everybody in the industry does this, right? I mean, this is normal, right? You know, and I just didn't even think about it twice until the situation blew up in my face. But then that leads to the question, well, if you're not going to be using third parties as pretexts, then what are you going to be using? <laughs> you know, I mean, you can use things from the target organization that's reasonably, you know, safe because the, the target organization themselves have signed a waiver with you. You know, you can also make up pretexts, but that's expensive, you know, because if you're going to actually try and pretend, you know, to be a fake organization, that would mean you would actually need to create a plausible website for them and, you know, and, and all the context surrounding it. And of course, you know, who has the time and the budget for that? So it's actually kind of difficult, you know. So then, you know, the question really is, uh, you know, is there some way to solve this problem? I mean, I can't really think of actually an easy way to solve it. I mean, is it? 
perhaps possible that you could get a group of organizations together that give each other permission, you know, to use each other as phishing pretexts, you know, uh, on the presumption that, you know, everybody needs to do phishing exercises occasionally, and, and it could very well be that, you know, you want to use some low-hanging fruit, you know, third parties to, as pretexts to get people to click on them. You know, and perhaps, you know, on a friendly basis, could organizations maybe agree to allow others to use their identity for, for each other's phishing, you know, uh, mails. I mean, I don't know if anybody actually is going to care enough to, to want to start such an initiative like this, but I mean, it, it could be one possible solution. But as you guys can see, it's actually really quite a tricky problem, you know. And I think that it's something that at least I'd never heard anybody thinking about it before. And I'm hoping that, you know, perhaps after this talk, maybe I've stimulated, you know, this, uh, th this discussion now, then you guys can think about it. And if you guys have any answers for how to solve this ethical problem, I'm all ears, you know. I want to hear it. So, uh, so, uh, but then back, uh, I guess, to technical lessons learned. So, um, if you want to stop our phishing, phishing spam, uh, there's a number of ways to do it. So, first of all, check uh, SPF and uh, DKIM values on your uh, inbound mail. Another thing that you can do to try and, uh, f well, s f stop this kind of uh, phishing attacks, or at least try and hinder it, is to disable default image loading in email clients. You know, for the similar similar reasons why you're trying to stop, you know, for privacy reasons, you know, all the click analytics things that are going on, it could very well be that malicious attackers are also using the same tools uh, to try and see if you're opening stuff or not. So, uh, so you know, disabling image loading by default, but also disabling HTML in general is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, flag newly registered domains is suspicious. You know, click analytics.amsterdam. I mean, we only registered it you know, a week before the job started, right? Here, <laughs> you know, or maybe a week into the job. So when you see domains that are extremely new, I mean, and of course you have this more often anyway when you're dealing with things like, uh, you know, fast fluxing uh, of domains. I mean, so I think in general, just for, for you know, uh, yeah, domain name generation anyway in terms of malware and IOCs is, is kind of uh, relevant. But also for, for spam, if you, if you see anything newly registered, that's a reason perhaps to red flag it. Security awareness training. I mean, of course, uh, you know, at the end, uh, if you're doing these kinds of things, it's, it's good to give a presentation to actually inform your staff of what you just did and what lessons they can learn from it. You know, in this particular case, I, I wanted to give also this talk to a wider audience <laughs> because I think that there were a lot of interesting lessons from this uh, that hopefully everyone can benef benefit from, even though some of the lessons were a little bit surprising. But... Um, of course, at the end, uh, awareness training only gets you so far. You know, I mean, one thing that I really like to say and to tell people is that actually, you know, a really well-crafted phishing attack, you know, I would click on it. I mean, if it were really well-crafted. And the point is that you need to understand that awareness isn't enough. You need technical backups. You know, you need defense in depth. Because ultimately, if somebody really wants to fish you, they're going to. You know, it's just a matter of putting enough uh, effort into uh, constructing a believable pretext. So, you know, again, you want to pick up the low-hanging fruit, but you also want to understand that you need defense in depth because it's not going to be foolproof. And also, uh, monitor network traffic. And that's actually kind of interesting, perhaps, for uh, incident response later. Uh, both with the uh, Mozilla fake uh, security update email, but also with uh, what we did with setup. Of course, uh, they actually went into their server logs and, uh, you know, we're actually able to do some amount of sort of forensic analysis on it sort of after the fact. You know, at least SurfNet was able to. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to try and figure out where this uh, came from. You know, if you're not doing the logging and you're not doing the monitoring, then, of course, you're not going to be able to tell uh, where this stuff came from. So, uh, again, that's, again, just best practices uh, that hopefully you guys can do. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, I found uh, myself this, this job to be extremely interesting. Uh, I hope that uh, you guys also found this presentation to be interesting. Maybe you learned something. And uh, if anybody has any comments or questions, I would be happy to take them right now. So, once again, now the... <laughs> Could you come closer to the mic? Well, is it on? Well, OK, thank you. Is it on now? Uh, the first question, uh, ethical issue. I also perform such tests, and it's not covered. Give you the 
the names of the employees who clicked on your phishing or spear phishing mails to your client or not. Because if the client gives the names of the employees they clicked, that can massive influence on this specific employees have. Yeah. Okay, so I guess uh, your question really is, uh, should we be uh, tracking the names of these people just in case naming and shaming is going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of naming and shaming. Uh, I think that with these kinds of experiments, it could be a good thing maybe to imp approach the people individually, privately. You know, I mean, it, because I think some amount of personal feedback, you know, is, is maybe okay. It could very well be also that uh, a, an alternative is after the landing page, instead of just uh, having insert malware here, you could actually have another page that explains, by the way, this is, was just a phishing test, you know, <laughs> and you just clicked. That could be maybe another way of uh, handling uh, the situation, <laughs> you know, in a way that they get immediate feedback that, oh, crap, I just clicked, you know, without actually having to... Uh, name and shame people. So I agree with you. I mean, I think that uh, calling people out in front of their colleagues is generally not a good idea. But I also think that you don't have to. I mean, if I give a presentation like this, I like to give aggregate statistics. If people clicked, they know who they are. But I, I, I usually don't think it's a, a good idea to uh, try and embarrass anybody. Yeah, sure. But it's more ethical than, for me, uh, can I use a LinkedIn content or Facebook, whatever. Well, I mean, I think they're separate ethical issues, but yeah. Okay, yeah. Frank. Thank you. Next. Yeah. So, um, basically, uh, a suggestion and uh, a suggestion and a co and a question. So, at first, the suggestion. Um, so, when it comes to uh, the, the, can we use other uh, organizations? Well, uh, I've been, I've been doing a, a like a, a phishing exercise as well where we not so much used another organization, but used the principle of word blindness. So in case of your email errors, radical.sexy, mm -hmm. just switch the D and the I, made it radical.sexy. Mm -hmm. And that gives you, in a domain name, just a, a large number of possibilities, which you can just use the type of squatting principle for uh, phishing people, and they sure. will fall for that, yeah. without, of course, having to abuse other organizations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for the question, so, uh, I mean, of course, you you are uh, tracking all the all the uh, all the people that clicked and the images that have been gone. Uh, have you also considered like uh, the the privacy implications of storing that information and how long you can store it for? Uh yeah. Um, well, I consider that kind of information to be similar to generic pen testing information. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, both fr you know from the spirit of the law as well as the spirit of uh, just trying to do things right. I mean, it's best not to retain you know, personal data and customer data any longer than we have to. Um, you know, periodically at Radically Open Security, we go, you know, archiving and purging uh, pen test repositories uh, for our various uh, customers. How long we keep it around sort of usually tends to be how long we think we need it for. Uh, in the case of the spear phishing suite, I mean, we've basically taken the, the suite itself and kind of made it generic. Oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, we open sourced this. So the actual toolkit itself is available on our GitHub. So if you go to radicallyopensecurity.com, I'm sorry, if you go to github.com slash radicallyopensecurity, uh, the spear phishing toolkit is actually on there. Um, you know, uh, well, uh, people, of course, have also asked, uh, do you feel it's ethical open sourcing this toolkit? But uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I assume that the, the real attackers, the evil guys, have their own toolkits uh, as well. So, but... Um, yeah, so, so the generic stuff uh, I try and separate out and keep uh, the actual customer data. I try to um, purge every so often. Uh, you know, if I think that they're going to want repeated, you know, uh, retests or, or, you know, that kind of stuff, then I might keep it around a little bit longer. But, uh, yeah, I mean, to me, that's more a generic data retention issue, yeah. not, sure. a not a phishing issue. Thank you. Hi, Melanie. Once again, a nice talk. A yeah. small technical question. You mentioned that you found 26 individual IP addresses from which there was clicked. Is that yes. Where are these from? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they're not all from the uh, organization itself, but from remote users, or what was that? Yeah, um, I think it probably was a mix. I mean, you know, some of it, I think, were on their work machines or laptops. I mean, some of it was from their mobile devices. I mean, we saw a mix of uh, clients. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can track that somewhat from the uh, web logs uh, from the landing page. So, 
And doesn't that influence? I mean, doesn't that have implications for, say, the target's ability to do uh, forensics on on whatever they're sort of clicking on? Because uh, it sounds like they would miss a lot of the activity of their staff. How would they miss activity? Well, I mean, if they're clicking from IP addresses that they're not controlled by the organization, I mean, they don't control those 26 IP addresses, not all of them. Yeah. Um, look, I think that basically, again, they were using multiple devices. And we can actually verify that anyway, because the uh, hash that we were using uh, basically translates back to the email address uh, that we sent the, to the target. So if we can see that multiple IP addresses are actually coming from a single email address, and we can see that one of them is maybe a MacBook Pro and the other one is an Android phone, you know, I mean, that also, of course, uh, gives us information about uh, the platforms uh, that the targets are using. Um, I mean, does it make our phishing any less effective? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that's that, that's very interesting uh, additional information, uh, but not the point I was I was looking at. And that is the um, op the um, opportunities that the target organization has to defend itself against these phishing attacks, because it, obviously they don't track all the click activity of their staff. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Anytime you have multiple devices, it makes monitoring it's and hard, controlling right? things harder. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for clarification. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, what I've seen as sort of most effective at getting people uh, where I work to click on emails has always been fake purchase orders, fake invoices. Yeah. That you ex and with that, you can actually target it to look like the type of customers they would typically have. Mm -hmm. Is that something uh, you experimented with? Um, with vendors. Uh, in this particular case with SurfNet, no. Uh, with other customers I've had, yes. So, um, yeah. I Again, it sort of depends on how we're t doing the targeting. I mean, I think th with this particular one, we were being a little bit wild in our use of uh, third parties, but I've also had, but again, the target was 150 employees. We've also done spear phishing where it actually really was spear phishing, and I was just targeting, like, for example, a support desk of an organization with, with real client-side malware, you know, to actually you know, be the first step of the kill chain. You know, in those cases, then we're going to approach it really differently. And then we're going to try and usually use something that's a little bit closer to the organization. Yeah. If a, regu if a regular spam filter is already kind of a pain for people doing uh, yeah. spear phishing, should we be training uh, Bayesian filters specifically to spot spear phishing as dis distinct from other kinds of spam and, and basically giving organizations a a set of metrics, like how many spear phishing emails are you getting right now? Uh, where are they coming from? Uh, how many people are opening them? Um, and, and just, you know, get that view into, into the IT department. Yeah, that, that is a super question. I never thought of it. I, I think to me that sounds like interesting research. Thank you. So uh, no more questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, yeah. Um, so I've got a question. Um, I'm just curious, uh, how many of you are professionals in this field that do spear phishing? Can I see a small raise of hands? Uh, well, that you do, you do spear, you're involved in spear phishing uh, uh, activity to te pen test, for example. Okay, so and, and what percentage of you uh, use other organizations as a cover to do that? So if, if you raise your hands first and then put them down if you don't. So could you raise your hand if you do spear phishing? All right, so that's, and then raise them down if you don't do that. <laughs> so, sorry, yeah, that's unclear. Uh, if you don't, do, um, don't use other organizations, then you can put your hand down again. So I just want to see the hands up in the air of the people who do that use other organizations. So that's only one I, person. I think his question two. is how many of you here use third parties yeah. as pretexts sorry. Your, during your phishing Too much beer last Raise time. your hand if you use third parties. Okay, so that's th pretext. thank you for, 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 for saying that. And I'm just curious to hear you guys talk about this um, because, of course, as <laughs> organization being used as pretext, we were a little bit surprised. I'm a little bit surprised as well to hear that this is such a common practice. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear other voices on, on, on the ethical question of that, because we, we did not like this <laughs> at all. <laughs> so all red team engagements... Oh. 
Our uh, team I, engagements are very much backed by governance and compliance that comes from central Sorry, I government. can't understand you what you're saying, sorry. I said our red team engagements are very much backed by compliance that comes from central government. So we have we roll all the way up the tree to, yeah, for example, the Bank of England, CSG, etc. So there's a degree of um, responsibility that flows all the way down. Um, we've not had any instances where it's caused a specific problem, but on the other hand, we also maintain quite a large stock of credible domains, credible um, assets that sit outside um, either a real organization or outside the target organization. Okay, and, and so with, with your case, you say there's some kind of chain of command where you can, the organizations you, who you use as cover are somehow related to the organization you're testing, so then there's some kind of responsibility or? Uh, they, they certainly can be. I, it, it, it largely depends, but yeah, there, there are instances and opportunities to leverage that. Um, yeah, if we're working for for a bank, the chances are that they roll up to the Bank of England, for example. Um, there, are, there are yeah, there are conversations that can be had because we are trying to simulate um, as close to real world as possible. Yeah. And it's never blown up in your face. Yeah. Indeed, that does lead to uh, opportunistic domain squatting by security companies, uh, and, and I've seen this also happen yeah. multiple times. So. It's never blown up in our face. The most amusing incident was when we um, uh, pretended to be an upstream ISP of our target. Um, and essentially reported ourselves for phishing um, just, to see, just to see how that would work. And we ended up getting responses back that indicated that they thought we were the upstream ISP. So, but okay. no, not, never seen it blowed up. And you, you? I have a question. If you, uh, for the breach investigation, did you get the headers of the email? For us? Yeah. Like before you started looking, if you were spamming actually the surfnet, have you looked at like did you request them to send you the email that they were spammed with? Because then you would probably seen that it was not you spamming, right? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, the my, my colleague might have. Uh, so I was more busy with trying to fix the web server, and he was more busy on that side of communicating with surfnet. So that's I'm sorry I can't answer that. Yeah, as I understand things, I mean, they got the, uh, the t setup got the technical details from Surf. And yes, Surf looked at the mail server headers. And we, again, as I said before, we made absolutely zero attempt at hiding our tracks. So it was obvious that we were using the radically open security mail server. We made absolutely no attempts to, uh, to cover this up. So yes, they, they noticed this extremely quickly. Thank you. But yeah, all right. Thank, thank you. <laughs>